The problem this evening is one which I hope that most of you will never be directly involved with. For during many years in which I have been a kind of last resort for troubled people, I've had much too frequent contact. Uh, with this situation, and I think it's only fair that it should be reported and recorded and preserved for those who need it or have a mind to accept it. We all know that the human being is at great, at great disadvantage in the presence of a mystery. We are able to handle the everyday occurrences with a certain amount of skill because we honestly believe that the adversaries that we face are known to us. We can measure our skill against theirs, and if need arises, we can run away and continue the struggle at some other time. But in a mystery, we are totally disoriented. The average person cannot function too much or too often in the presence of intangible factors. Even a little mystery arising in a family can prove to be most disorienting. Secrets are dangerous things because we, we have no way of fighting them. We have very little way of fighting gossips and poison pens and anonymous letters. They all involve certain elements of mystery. Things are intangible. We cannot face them and have it out. From the earliest time, man had more courage in the day than he had in the night. Even when he had his own private cave, this cave was a lot safer as far as he was concerned in the daylight than it was in darkness. After he built houses and put locks on his doors and barred his windows, he was still happier in the daytime than he was at night because in night, Perhaps old boards would creak or something of that nature. The man became afraid again. In our modern scientific life, man is afraid once more because he is afraid of formulas which he cannot understand. He is afraid of tremendous energies which he, he cannot cope with. They are all mysteries to him. We are a little bit afraid of the minds of other people. We do not know what they are thinking about. We are afraid that they are perhaps planning some secret exploitation of our resources, whatever these things may be. Long ago, man passed through a terrible nightmare, a nightmare of secrets and of darkness and of magic intensified by a great common belief in the power of evil. The demons lurked in darkness at old crossroads. The fear of spirit possession, the fear of excommunication, of bewitchment, and all these things weighed very heavily upon some of our ancestors. They really never knew how to cope with them. They died as much of terrors of the common ailments of the flesh. So when today we observe the long shadow of mystery reaching into our private lives, there is a certain anxiety. We are not able to cope with the problem effectively. And there are certain questions that I think we all must ask. It has been rather well established by ESP researchers that there are possibilities of a certain kind of clairvoyance, 
The thought transference is very probably a reality and will sometime uh, be standardized or at least far better understood than it is now. We are more or less convinced that clairvoyance is within the reasonable probability of things and many different extrasensory potentials are being experienced within ourselves. To a degree, these discoveries are important and useful and helpful, and perhaps they will support our basic idealism and our, or our conviction that the universe is a far greater and more important place than we have ever learned that it was. But there's always this little lurking problem. So we can put it in a very simple words of one individual who spent quite a sum of money to have mental absent treatments. This individual was very anxious that a certain person that they knew to change their way of life. So they hired someone, a practitioner, to go to work on the issue. And after a reasonable length of time, the object of all this attention did make some changes in their way of life including a will in favor of the individual who came to me. Well, this sounded like higher mentalism, uh, doing a pretty good job. You would get testimonials very easily for such procedures. But suddenly the person who came to me broke out in a cold sweat. Uh, this uh, was a little problem. If they could change another individual and get a will in their favor, was it possible that some other individual could change them? While we were out mentally dominating somebody else, could it be that somebody else was trying to mentally dominate us? Do these processes work both ways? If it is possible for us to send our thoughts to change the life of someone else, uh, could someone else send their thought and change our lives? If we want to make someone else do something they do not want to do, can they return the favor in kind? It is one of these things in which uh, it was a good rule, but it shouldn't work both ways. Each person feels that he has a right to change others, but he doesn't like the thought that somebody might be secretly trying to change him. The moment we get into this problem, our freedom of action, our freedom of thought, all these things evaporate. Where will it begin? Where will it end? If one person can influence, influence us, so can 50 or 100 or 1,000. If one individual can cause another person to have a loss out of revenge or out of spite, can somebody else cause us to have a loss the same way, like the old bruja? If we can pray our enemies to death, can our enemies pray us to death? It just doesn't look so well when we open this mysterious door between the commonplace and the unusual. We step immediately into a world, first of all, a region which we know nothing about. We have no background in our own experience to cope with these intangibles. All we have to work with is a, is a tremendous tendency to fantasy in ourselves, an imagination that can get out of hand even with the commonplace, let alone the unusual, and a mind that has very little foundation in any form of essential courage or fact or reasonableness. With a nature, therefore, that is lacking in most of the requirements of prudence and common sense, it is very easy to get deeper and deeper into a world of wonders that can change gradually and inevitably into a world of terrors. It is a rather dangerous situation for the person to suddenly leave behind the landmarks that he has and knows and depends upon and sail out into an uncharted ocean 
of mystical and occult possibilities. My experience with this type of situation is that 99 out of 100 land in shipwreck before it's over. They might be able to handle the situation with some dignity if they were very wise or very poised or very well integrated. But who ever heard of an individual very poised and very well integrated who ever got mixed up in these things? Nine-tenths of the potential victims of their own foolishness in this direction are themselves neurotic. They are persons whose lives have been in one way or another, unhappy, frustrated, pressure-ridden. They are not thorough scholars. They are not deeply thoughtful individuals, trained thinkers. They are persons who have drifted along through the years, studying a little of this and a little of that, joining this organization and then that organization and most of them in trouble from the mere process of chronic joining. So many of these organizations threaten their members that if the member leaves for any reason, some dark and mysterious curse will fall upon them. This is enough to wreck a life immediately. The individual living in the 20th century still has the old primordial instinct to be afraid of curses and afraid of the evil thoughts of others. And the moment we give these evil thoughts a large place in our own thinking, we can begin to feel these thoughts moving in on us. Our lives can become haunted by the mere fears that arise from negative speculations about the unknown. If these speculations didn't rise as the result of certain interest in metaphysical matters, uh, the individual would probably immediately consider the possibility that he's mentally ill. But if um, this is part of some strange mystical procedure, he doesn't think of himself as ill at all. He thinks of himself as illuminated. He thinks of himself as having reached new dimensions of consciousness. But then these new dimensions of consciousness begin to go to work on him. And uh, before it's over, we realize that he has simply uh, used this strange unknown as a catalyst for his own neurosis. So we can't uh, too strongly recommend that persons be extremely cautious in trying to explore areas where their knowledge is simply insufficient. Now, knowledge in itself is a very good thing. We should know about everything, even things we do not really agree with, or even things we do not want to believe. We should know about them. We should never assume for a moment that ignorance is an asset. There's a great deal of difference, however, between understanding the theories and practices of certain beliefs and the effort to dabble with them ourselves. There is no reason why we shouldn't understand the theories behind transcendentalism if it intrigues us. But there are many reasons why we shouldn't dabble with it. Especially, this is true, where we actually haven't even any very solid groundwork in theory. It's one thing, perhaps, to make some modest experimentation after 20 years of careful study, in which we really have done our own study, not simply taken somebody else's word for it, read a few uh, ancient books or modern reprints. But to approach these things haphazardly, in a strange, childlike faith that somehow we are going to be protected from our own foolishness, uh, this simply does not pay off except in terms of tragedy. Now, one thing that's not too important at this stage of our thinking is whether uh, all this weird and wonderful world is a reality or simply a psychological condition within ourselves. 
Whether all this magic is a psychic phenomena or a psychological phenomena is not perhaps so important at this point. Regardless of which it is, it has the same effect on us. And uh, when we add to this a certain amount of coincidence, a certain amount of...